So it is 1.36. Um, so I'm hoping our speakers are here. And I'm going to go ahead and get us started. So my name is Eve. I am a member of the risk leadership team, and I'm going to be moderating this session. So welcome to this part of the symposium. You've made it this far. Um, and today we're going to be talking about treatment strategies and efficacy in a changing climate. We have three speakers coming from, from really different places, which is exciting. Um, and each of their talks is gonna be about 15 minutes, and then we'll have five minutes after each talk for questions. So if you have a question at any time, you can submit it to the Q&A box, which you should see at the bottom toolbar of Zoom. Um, and then when each talk is over, I'll, I'll help moderate questions to different speakers. And then just so everyone's aware, the session does not have a panel session at the end. So if you wanna ask your question, um, try to get it in that five minutes in between talks. So first up, we have Julie Gould coming from the US Department of Agriculture, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service. And Julie is going to be talking about a larval parasitoid of the emerald ash borer. So Julie, whenever you're ready, go ahead and share your screen and we'll get started. Okay, <clears throat> how is that? Can you see the title slide? Yep, looks great. Okay, and I was not informed it was 15 minutes with five questions. I have a 20 minute talk, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> so, um, so I'm gonna be talking about um, some of the phenology of emerald ash borer and its parasitoids and how climate change uh, will affect the relationship between the two, between the host and the parasitoid um, as climate change um, begins to affect our planet. Um, emerald ash borer was um, first discovered in southeastern Michigan feeding on ash trees in 2002. It was thought to have been introduced to North America at least 10 years prior to that discovery and it probably came in on solid wood packing material. Um, and emerald ash borer is um, a beetle in the um, Buprestid um, family and it's in the genus Agrylus and like most Agrylus it often has a one-year life cycle but if conditions are right it can have a two-year life cycle and the life cycle of the beetle is very important to the uh, what happens with the parasitoids. Um, in a one-year life cycle the adults emerge in the spring and they um, do what's called maturation feeding for a couple of weeks. The adults then mate and the female will lay eggs in the cracks of ash, um, the bark of ash trees. Um, these are, are some of her eggs um, right here. And then after a few weeks, the larvae begin to feed and mo the larvae when they feed are feeding between the bark and the, cam and the um, hardwood. They're feeding in the cambium phloem layer. layer. And when if in a one year life cycle, right before the uh, winter comes on, the emerald ash borer larvae actually dig an overwintering chamber in the woods. So they go further down in the tree and they form what are called J larvae. And that's, we call them that because they're in a J shape. You can see one here. Uh, they then spend the winter in these overwintering chambers as J larvae um, pupate in the spring. Uh, the adults then emerge and start over again. But as we will see during my talk, there are factors that affect whether they have a one-year or a two-year life cycle. Um, and emerald ash borer is incredibly damaging. Uh, this is, uh, in the upper right, this is a log uh, where the bark has been peeled off, exposing the galleries of these beetles. And you can see that they just cover the entire surface of the tree. And when this happens, um, the trees are eventually killed. Uh, first, the tops of the trees are first killed and girdled and then the entire tree. And to date, hundreds of millions of trees have died and there's huge economic and environmental losses due to this very devastating pest. I've been working since the early 2000s on biocontrol of emerald ash borer. Um, I've been to China and Korea and other um, of my colleagues have been to Russia and we've been looking for natural enemies that attack the emerald ash borer. And in 2007, we got permission to release three parasitic wasps. Uh, one of them that I will not be talking about today is Avobius agrilli. It attacks the eggs of emerald ash borer. Um, but we also got permission to release two larval parasitoids, 
Tetrasticus planopanisi, which is a very uh, small insect, and then um, Spathius agrili, which is a little bit bigger. So we started releases in 2007, and this is the life cycle of Tetrasticus. This is an endoparasitoid. It lays its, it actually sticks its ovipositor through the bark and inside of the emerald ash borer larvae where it lays its eggs inside the larva. Uh, in the picture at the top, you can see tiny larvae swimming around inside the hemolymph of the emerald ash borer larvae. These um, parasite, parasitoid larvae eventually totally consume the emerald ash borer and fill up the entire body of the emerald ash borer. They then burst forth, um, uh, they, pup they have naked pupae, they don't spin cocoons like some species, and then they start the cycle all over again. And they will have up to three or four generations per year on the emerald ash borer. Um, the other insect that we released early on was Spathius uh, agrilli, which can be seen here. Ovo its ovipositor is penetrating through the bark. Um, and it actually lays its eggs external to the emerald ash borer. It's an ectoparasitoid. Its larvae feed externally on the emerald ash borer, consuming it, and then they eventually form cocoons inside of the emerald ash borer gallery. Again, they can have several generations per year. Um, these parasitoids have already been released in 30 of the 35 states that are infested with emerald ash borer. And you can see from this um, map that it encompasses a large swath of the United States where these parasites have been released. And climate, um, we think, really affects their ability to establish. Um, Tetrasticus planopanisi has been recovered from 17 states. In the northern part of the country, it's persisting very well and it's dispersing and it's having a real impact on emerald ash borer populations. Spathius agrelli, on the other hand, was recovered in six states, but so far it has failed to establish in the north. We've never recovered it more than two years after release. So Climate modeling and climate matching showed that Tianjin, China, where we recovered, where we um, collected uh, Spathius agrilli, it's much more similar to the southern United and central United States. We have been, we were releasing them in the north where they weren't establishing, but climate matching showed that it was actually more suited to the southern and central U.S. Um, so the Emerald Ash Borer Program decided to conserve its resources and only release um, Spathius agrilli south of the 40th parallel. But there was a problem because Tetrasticus planopanisi is very little. It has a short ovipositor and it can only oviposit through smaller diameter ash trunks and branches where the bark isn't very thick. So we needed a big um, insect like um, Spathius agrilli, and fortunately we found one in Spathius galeni. This insect is collected from Russia, and um, it has a long ovipositor, and the climate, if you look at the map, climate matching shows that it's the, the um, climate in Vladivostok, Russia is much more similar to the northern United States, which is where we, where we need this to work. It's also quite species specific and we got unanimous support for a release permit. And we have actually now recovered this species from seven states. So it is in fact doing a lot better than Spathius agrilli was in the north. Um, so we asked the question of why was it that Spathius agrilli wasn't doing very well in the north and how does the phenology of the emerald ash borer and the phenology of the parasitoids affect the parasitoids' ability to establish and to exert control on emerald ash borer? Well, one of the things we found in, in these early studies was that EAB populations in the south exhibit a one-year life cycle, like I was talking about. And the majority of EAB overwintering as J larvae, and they're in overwintering chambers deep in the wood, and they are not available to parasitoids in the spring. Um, in the north, where it's colder, 
EAB overwinter in all larval stages, some J larvae, some young larvae, some mature larvae, all, all stages. Um, we also in this study found that Spathius galeni and Tetrasicus planiponisi emerge early in the spring when only larvae, when larvae are only available in the north. In the south, there wouldn't be larvae available. So these two species of parasitoids are unlikely to establish where EAB has a one-year life cycle. We also discovered that Spathius agrilli emerges well over a month after EAB does. And it is synchronized with EAB that has a one-year life cycle. Um, we also found that in the north, it has a dead-end fall generation, which explains why it was not establishing. So our expectation is, is that we expect Spathius galeni and Tetrasticus planiponisi to establish in the north and Spathius agrilli to establish in the south. But the problem is, is that north to south, there's a gradient of temperatures and conditions. And so we wanted to look at the practical questions of to what extent does the percentage of EAB overwintering as non-J larvae decline as you move from north to south? And how does the proportion of EAB overwintering as non-J larvae affect parasitoid establishment? So um, I'm just, just a reminder, um, non-J larvae on the left, these are up under the surface of the bark. Um, these are what are available to emerald ash borer parasitoids in the spring. J larvae in deep in these overwintering chambers and not available for parasitization. So we conducted a very large nationwide study of the stages in which EAB overwintered. We sampled overwintering stages of EAB at over 90 sites in 22 states, uh, thanks to a large number of cooperators who helped us with this project. And we did this sampling over two years. Um, we, and, and by that I mean Melissa Warden, my co-author, uh, produced a model looking at how the percentage of EAB overwintering as larvae was related to summer accumulation of degree days. Um, and we linked this model to the probability of establishment of Tetrasticus planiponisi. And then we explored changes to the model that might be predicted under climate change scenarios. And this is what we found. There was a very strong re negative relationship between summer heat accumulation and EAB overwintering stage. The, the, um, the um, the temperature parameters we looked at were the number of growing degree days, base 50 degrees Fahrenheit, that accumulated between January 1st and September 30th. And the hypothesis was, is that the warmer it is during the summer, the faster the EAB will develop and the more likely they are to become J larvae as opposed to entering the winter as larvae under the bark. And that's exactly what we found. The more growing degree days that were accumulated, the higher the proportion of EAB that became J larvae. We then created a model um, and looked at the parts of the United States um, that fell into um, five different categories of predicted probability of overwintering as J larvae. Each color represents the proportion or the probability that an individual larva will be a, uh, an a non-J larva as opposed to a J larva. So we, the higher the proportion of non-J larvae, the more likely we think it is for the parasitoids to establish. And you can see that in the South, we expect fewer than 13% of the larvae, um, of the EAB to be overwintering as larvae. And then um, as you move North or up in elevation, you get um, higher, um, higher probabilities of overwintering as larvae. The red dots um, are indicative of places where we found Tetrasticus planiponisi at least two years after release, and the white dots showed where we looked, but we never were able to recover Tetrasticus. So um, we then developed a threshold 
uh, or calculated a threshold of how many growing degree days we predicted would be needed for the um, for larvae to enter these various um, categories of percentage overwintering as larvae. Um, if the if you have more than 3,892 growing degree days in the summer, we expect there to be between 13 and 30 percent EAB overwintering as larvae. Um, and we also expected, based on our data, that 57 there would be a 57 percent chance that Tetrasticus would establish. Below that, at less than 13 percent larvae, we would only expect Tetrasticus to establish 21 percent of the time. And the more heat units that are accumulated, the higher the threshold and the higher the percentage of um, probability that Tetrasticus would establish. And by the time you get into the 46 to 75 percent overwintering as EAB, the per you really can say that if you release Tetrasticus, you really do expect that it will over um, that it will establish. So um, I, I finally am going to get to the part of the talk, which I, I hope will interest you on the effects of climate change. Um, it's just my my last um, my last two slides. Just for reference, this is the predicted proportion of non-J larvae and Tetrasticus establishment in 2020, the, so last year. And I'd like you to focus in on the 40th parallel as a, as a reference line. And you can see that even below the 40th parallel, there's, there's plenty of green area, which um, shows that it's between 14 and 30% uh, probability of an EAB overwintering as um, as a larva as opposed to a J larva. But what what happens under climate change scenarios? We used an estimate of climate change that was moderate. Um, it assumes that humans are going to have some, um, they're going to slow the effects of climate change somewhat, but not dramatically. And by 2045, you can see that there's just a little bit of green below the 40th parallel, and there's a big swath of the center of the country that has all of a sudden become very, um, very unlikely that uh, EAB will overwinter as uh, larvae or that parasitoids could establish. And then by the time you get to 2070, you can see that there's an even bigger uh, part of the country where we just don't think that Tetrasticus will able to be able to establish. And it's very likely that even if they did establish during the initial releases, that as, um, as climate change goes forward, these areas will no longer be acceptable, at, you know, um, would, would no longer be a, um, a good climate for uh, persistence of the parasitoids and that they would probably go extinct locally. And you can see that even Southern Michigan, which is where we got started and we got great um, establishment of Tetrasicus, that even there, it has become less and less likely that uh, Tetrasicus will persist. The one thing that is very interesting though is the changes do not really happen in the Appalachians and in New England and in the Rocky Mountains. Those parts of the country, um, for whatever reason, um, still remain um, relatively suitable for um, establishment and persistence of Tetrasticus. So in summary, um, we found that warmer temperatures lead to a higher proportion of EAB overwintering as J larvae and these Larvae are not available to parasitoids emerging in the spring. Tetrasticus planiponesi is more likely to establish in places where there are um, more non-J larvae overwintering. Um, we established a growing degree day threshold to guide the parasitoid releases. These are now being used by our Emerald Ash Borer Biocontrol Release Program to dictate where releases are made. And as our planet warms, some areas of the United States that are currently suitable for Tetrasticus will inevitably become unsuitable for this parasitoid. And uh, thank you for your attention.